Our first speaker is going to be Ruse, because I can't pronounce his last name. You can say that for yourself if you want to introduce yourself. And he is a graduate of MIT and the Chief Scientific Officer of OxoCell. So my uh, presentation today is titled Perinatal Mesenchymal Stem Cell Banking for Umbilical Cord Blood Transplantation and Regenerative Medicine. So before I begin, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about our company, OxoCell. Uh, we're a, a Cambridge, Massachusetts-based company founded in 2008. Um, we are the exclusive licensee of uh, the early uh, dominating IP in the isolation, harvest, cryopreservation, and utilization of orange jelly-derived uh, MSCs um, for cell-based therapies and regenerative medicine. And our mission is to develop and, uh, these technologies into fruitful um, uh, therapies. So I have a few introductory uh, slides that I'll go through pretty quickly since I hope that a lot of us uh, are, are comfortable with, the, with this information. Uh, but it's paramount to my, uh, uh, to my slides that I, that I do present this uh, information, so bear with me. So in the adult human, as we know, uh, hematopoiesis takes place in the bone marrow uh, and is constantly being reju rejuvenated by uh, two main uh, types of stem cells. One is the hematopoietic stem cell, um, oops, I just gave up my next slide. Can we go back one slide, please? Oh, there we go. Um, uh, hematopoietic stem cell, which gives rise to uh, hematopoietic cells, blood cells in the, in, the, in, the, in the human adult. The other stem cell is the mesenchymal stem cell that is a supportive stem cell for hematopoiesis and uh, for, uh, for the differentiation of mesodermal cell types. Uh, the hematopoietic stem cell is actually thought to reside along the endosteal surface of the, of the bone um, in a nurturing environment quite often referred to as the microenvironment. Uh, and this microenvironment contains cells that produce uh, signals and cues and factors that, uh, that uh, regulate hematopoietic stem cell uh, 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 survival, self-renewal, and differentiation. And, and it's the mesenchymal stem cells that actually produce these factors. So there's this relationship between mesenchymal stem cells and hematopoietic stem cells within the adult uh, bone marrow. Due to their great regenerative potential, both hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells from uh, the adult uh, bone marrow uh, are used in both uh, transplantations and, and regenerative medicine applications. Uh, both uh, HSCs and MSCs exist in uh, other types of tissues as well. Um, I'm going to be focusing on perinatal or afterbirth uh, sources of, of tissue or, or of, of uh, HSCs and MSCs. Um, we know that uh, uh, in core blood uh, is a great source, is a rich source for hematopoietic stem cells, which is obviously found within the vessels um, in, in, the, in the cord. Uh, this is a cross-section of an umbilical cord, of a human umbilical cord. The mesenchymal stem cells are actually in the periphery of the vessels uh, uh, in what is quite often referred to as the Wharton's jelly. Uh, we know that umbilical cord blood is, is a great uh, source of hematopoietic stem cells, is a rich source of hematopoietic stem cells, uh, but due to its also naive immune state, uh, these cells are, are uh, quite important uh, uh, cell uh, sources for uh, bone marrow transplantations or core blood transplantations. So having said that, we know that there's been um, multiple cell stem, uh, umbilical cord blood stem cell transplants worldwide. Uh, the biggest limitation for this is the delayed engraftment kinetics, and this is relative to really the golden standard in, in uh, hematopoietic reconstitution, which is bone marrow, uh, bone marrow sources. Um, uh, this uh, delayed engraftment kinetics shows itself in, in, in slow hematopoietic reconstitution, uh, which uh, increases the hospital hospitalization costs for the patient, as well as increases, and most importantly, increases the likelihood of infection uh, for the patient uh, who has a suppressed immune system, most likely. Uh, the most critical factor for umbilical cord blood and, and for this limitation is the um, is the uh, total nucleated cell dose. And uh, several approaches have actually been investigated in order to overcome these uh, limitations, or this limitation. The first uh, being multiple unit transplantations using multiple core blood units, 
by uh, inherently increasing the cell dose, um, but obviously there's a difficulty in finding multiple units that match the patient, as well as uh, the logistics of, of meeting the minimum criteria for the transplantation. Uh, another approach which hasn't been as successful has been ex vivo expansion of hematopoietic stem cells from core blood or pretty much any uh, hematopoietic source. Uh, to date, there's been no successful clinical demonstration of ex vivo expanded human hematopoietic stem cells although there's a lot of effort uh, in, this, in this area and uh, um, um, hopefully uh, we'll, have, we'll gain more understanding of, as the years go by to be able to resolve this. An approach that we've undertaken and investigated as well as other groups has been to co-infuse or co-transplant mesenchymal stem cells from the Wharton's jelly of the umbilical cord along with umbilical cord blood. Um, the, the notion behind this, or the rationale behind this is simple. Uh, when we do bone marrow transplantations, bone marrow uh, being that it's the, really the gold standard in, in, in hematopoietic reconstitution, um, has both mesenchymal stem cells and hematopoietic stem cells being infused into the patient. That is, uh, anatomically, uh, both the, the, the stem cell types are within, e within proximity to each other um, in their environments or microenvironments. Uh, unlike the bone marrow um, in, in the cord tissue, the mesenchymal stem cells and the hematopoietic stem cells are compartmentalized. That is, they're not within uh, the same structure within the tissue. So we hypothesized that if uh, we could co-transplant mesenchymal stem cells from the umbilical cord with cord blood, and this is all human, uh, human sources, um, what would we achieve in terms of the engraftment? So we designed an experiment where we co-transplanted, um, where we processed and cryopreserved uh, umbilical cords, human umbilical cords, um, uh, and, and derived uh, Wharton's jelly-derived uh, MSCs, and uh, uh, as, as well as mononuclear cells from umbilical cord blood. We cryopreserved them, thawed them after some time, quantified them for count, viability, and marker expression, typical things that we do. And uh, we transplanted them at various allo uh, aliquots or uh, into um, various allocated uh, um, uh, mouse cohorts, transplantation cohorts. Um, we had five different cohorts uh, in this study. Um, our negative control obviously had uh, no cells transplanted, just the dilutant. Uh, positive controls were uh, mice were transplanted with a million mononuclear cells uh, from cord blood per mouse. Uh, in our co-transplanted units, we were uh, transplanting a million core blood mononuclear cells per mouse with the addition of 10,000, 50,000, and 100,000 of the processed and cryopreserved, previously cryopreserved uh, native uh, Warren's jelly uh, MSCs. The mice that we used were non scedal 2 receptor gamma null mice. They were uh, sublethally irradiated and, and uh, transplanted the next day via tail vein. And uh, two weeks, uh, two months out, 60 days later, we that the mice were sacrificed and their bone marrow uh, was harvested. Uh, this is a typical xenotransplantation um, uh, experiment uh, uh, for uh, for testing hematopoietic engraftment capabilities of of human sources or non-murine sources. Um, uh, one of the markers that we look for in terms of the engraftment 60 days uh, later after we've transplanted within the bone marrow is, is, is for the presence of, of human uh, leukocyte antigen, CD45. And the data that I'll present to you are flow cytometry profiles of uh, CD45 uh, uh, expressing cells. So uh, here are scatter plots of, 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 of uh, fax profiles. Uh, we have CD45 uh, on the x-axis, side scatter, which is a, um, a measure of nuclear density um, on the y-axis. And really the, the place to pay attention to is the, is the gating to the right here. In our negative control, we don't see any expression of CD45 positive cells which suggests that, which is, I mean, not surprising since we didn't put any human cells uh, into these uh, mice, uh, but also shows that there's no cross-reactivity between, the, uh, between the, antibody, the human antibody and the um, mouse, uh, um, mouse bone marrow cells. In our positive control, we observe a slight level of engraftment, which is what we expect with a million mononuclear cells transplanted per mouse. 
in our co-transplanted cohorts, and these are all individual animals. They're not, um, I mean, obviously they're individual animals here. So in our co-transplanted cohorts, we see the presence of CD45 positive expressing bone marrow cells. Uh, these, this suggests that there's human engraftment within these animals. And when we do a summary, which is this slide here, um, looking at the uh, cohorts on the x-axis and the percent uh, CD45 expression uh, of uh, percent um, human CD45 positive cells within the bone marrow, what we find is that uh, um, at uh, statistical significance, we achieve a six-fold increase in human uh, engraftment uh, with uh, the core blood units uh, when we co-transplant 100,000 Wharton's jelly-derived MSCs along with uh, the umbilical cord blood mm, mononuclear cells, uh, a million mononuclear cells of, of the cord blood. So this data is quite interesting because it suggests that uh, by co-transplanting uh, mesenchymal stem cells from the cord tissue that you're enhancing the engraftment capabilities of the umbilical cord blood. Uh, other groups have actually uh, performed similar studies. Um, our, our friends over, um, our friends uh, Freeman et al. Um, actually um, performed these studies back in 2007 using ex vivo expanded mesenchymal stem cells from the Warren's jelly. And what they showed was that when they transplanted a million um, mononuclear cells of, of human core blood uh, along with, along with um, uh, Warren's jelly, a million mo Warren's jelly MSCs, they achieved a higher level of engraftment. Uh, more recently, in a clinical, in a preclinical, or in a clinical pilot study, uh, a, a group in uh, China uh, presented and uh, data that, uh, uh, for the first time, uh, clinical data where they use ex vivo expanded Warren's jelly derived MSCs uh, in co-transplanting um, in patients that were receiving cord blood transplantations, and they themselves uh, s saw an increase in engraftment. Uh, or a reduction in, in, in day two engraftment uh, with, the, with the cohort of, of patients that received um, uh, the, both the MSCs from the Warren's jelly and the uh, cord blood. So because of this, there's been a lot of interest by cord blood banks, both private and public, to bank umbilical cord. Um, and, and there's really two main methods of doing this. Uh, one method that we uh, we call the chop and freeze method is taking segments of, of cord tissue and mincing and freezing them. When requested by the client, the tissue is thawed and uh, ex vivo expanded, and um, this uh, product uh, is not readily available. Um, the other approach, which was which has been developed by our group, there it is. Um, uses a method of digesting the entire cord tissue, processing it to result in a cellular uh, product of native MSCs. Um, this is a transplant. Uh, uh, it's readily available and ready for transplant within hours. It's patent protected. And our method actually results in two independent cellular products, uh, native MSC product, that is the native MSCs within the cord tissue, as well as uh, a product that can be ex vivo expanded independent of each other. We are currently working on a proprietary umbilical cord processing system that we've denoted as UCPX. Um, it's a uh, product that, uh, or a system that uh, gives rise and results into in a, in a standardized product in a closed system. It gives rise to two independent products as, as, as before, as it does currently. Uh, it enables greater throughput of unit processing as compared with our current method. It reduces the uh, processing time per unit significantly, yields higher cell numbers because of the efficiency, enables a user, uh, a processor, to be able to process multiple units at the same time without worrying about uh, cross-contamination. This product is uh, expected in the second quarter of 2014 to be marketed after uh, 510K clearance and CE marking, and it has patent pending uh, status on it currently. I'm just going to finish up with uh, the regenerative medicine portion of, of my talk real quick. Um, beyond umbilical cord blood transplantation, Warren Silly Drive MSCs have, have uh, app application in, um, in uh, regenerative medicine uh, uh, therapies. Uh, really, the current ongoing clinical trials 
in, in this area has been using Bomar Drive MSCs, and there's two companies really leading the way for this, Osiris and Athersis. Um, uh, a lot of different indications that these cells are being tested currently are um, for autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, um, uh, neurological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and it's, it's really envisioned that uh, orange jelly MSCs would really be additional uh, product that could be used for these uh, indications one day after they've gone through the, uh, the clinical phase. And it's, it's, it's also envisioned that the UCPX system would be an important part of this uh, uh, process as well. Uh, last real slide, uh, my conclusion slide. Uh, uh, so by co-transplanting Warren's jelly-derived MSCs with core blood, we've been able to see and achieve a in increase in engraftment uh, in, in our xenotransplantation models. Other groups have also shown this as well. There's clinical data that's starting to come out, um, but more studies need to be done in order to ensure the um, uh, the safety and efficacy of these. Um, and really, this, this type of technology will bring to fruition the, um, the therapy, therapeutic potential of umbilical cord blood um, and allow for routine transplantation of not only pediatric patients, but also uh, adult patients as well. I'm just going to end by acknowledging my, my colleagues over at Oxocell, my collaborators at Tufts Medical Center and in Indiana University, and, the, and at the Community Blood Services. Thank you. Actually, uh, I actually wanted to help you out because there was something you didn't say that was on your slide. When you said speeded up engraftment, in the clinical trial in China, the engraftment of the co-transplant was 11 days. So that's within the holy grail of under two weeks that everybody is aiming for in expansion trials, you know, that, that people like uh, Colleen Delaney and Elizabeth Schwal have been trying to hit. So just plugging you. <laughs> I was going to say that, actually. Any questions? Uh, hi, great presentation. Greg Bonfilio from Proteus. When you talk about expansion of the cells, you had a number up there, 5X. Is that uh, what level of TNC counts are you getting from those cells? Can you talk a little bit more about that expansion and what data underlies the numbers you were, had on your slide? I, I didn't talk about expansion in terms of the UCPX system. Uh, so you're talking about the, the, the number of uh, the fold increase in cell numbers that we're able to achieve. So these are, uh, by increasing this, the efficiency of the system, we're able to achieve a, a lot greater recovery of the cells. So we've seen uh, at a minimum five-fold uh, increase in, the, in those numbers, and we've seen as high as ten-fold uh, under certain conditions as well, yeah. What TNC levels are you getting? Then? We're getting, um, so... Um, we're getting somewhere between 250 to 500,000 cells per gram. It's really hard to say uh, because the core tissue is dependent on the weight of the, the weight of the tissue. Uh, that that uh, it's it's uh, it's we usually use per gram as a metric for that. Um, in the mice, uh, those were cells that were not expanded, correct? The mesenchymal stem cells right. were not expanded, okay. yes. So um, in either your research or data that's out there, uh, has it been shown that the cells isolated using the chop and freeze method but not expanded are not sufficient for um, the clinical type of output for the engraftment? It's a, that's a great question. Actually, we have, uh, uh, if I understand your, your, your question correctly, we have uh, data, as does uh, other groups, um, where uh, by after you actually freeze the cells or the tissue and thaw them and try to recover those native MSCs, that the recovery is somewhere, it, it de decreases somewhere between seven to tenfold. So the amount of recovery that you're able to do post cryopreservation of those tissue, minced tissue fragments uh, is, is, is lost during that cryopreservation. So really, the only time to recover those native MSCs is, is, is to, di uh, to digest that tissue initially pre-cryopreservation and then cryopreserve those cells. And obviously, uh, DMSO diffusion within the tissue, uh, minced tissue, has something to do with that.
Right. Not as far as I'm aware. We haven't done those studies. Yeah. No. Mm 